Hi, my name is Lara Traeger, and I'm a clinical psychologist and researcher at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Thank you to Survivor Journeys for this opportunity, and thanks to you for taking out your time to watch this video. What I'm hoping to do over the course of the next 20 minutes or so is to talk about a specific kind of stress that we call post-traumatic stress. What I'm hoping for you is that you can walk away from this video with an understanding of what post-traumatic stress symptoms are and why they might happen in the context of a cancer diagnosis and treatment, and also to learn some ideas for how to take care of yourself or to support a loved one who may be experiencing these symptoms. So what are the signals of stress in general, not just post-traumatic stress, but stress, but just stress in general? What are the signs that you would be experiencing stress? It's helpful to do an inventory. So consider how stress impacts how you think, how you feel, and how you may behave or respond to that stress. So for example, if you're going through a stressful period, you might start to think about worst case scenarios, and that might lead you to feel more worn out than usual. And when you're feeling worn out, that might in turn lead you to keep to yourself or isolate or to lash out at others. So when you feel stressed in relation to your experiences with cancer or anything else, how does your stress show itself? One thing to consider is that um, it's just important to take a step back and talk about stress in general, because be before you even become aware that stress is impacting your thinking, your feeling, and your behaviors, it's likely that your body is already activated. It's what we call the stress response, otherwise known as fight, flight, or freeze. It's a fundamental body response to threat. It's normal to have this happen, and it's designed to get you out of harm's way. Sometimes, however, it gets in the way. So for example, these symptoms and signs that you may see on this slide, like your adrenaline going up, your heart rate, your blood pressure going up, they can help you if you're trying to run away from danger. But it's not so helpful when you are, let's say, having a stress response while getting an MRI or waiting for scan results or getting treatment or an injection. Generally, though, the stress response is short-lived and your body returns to baseline. But as you know, the experience of cancer is not one single stressor. So difficult situations can continue to occur. And sometimes you may even find that you're reliving situations that already happened. Um, you're reliving them in your mind. So that's a case where maybe you're starting to experience the stress response in a more ongoing or chronic way. So let's go now to talking about what kinds of stress are related to post-traumatic stress. What kinds of stressful events might lead to post-traumatic stress? This kind of stressors that we're talking about when it comes to post-traumatic stress are exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury or violation in any of the following ways. Either you directly experience it yourself, you witness it happening to somebody else, you learn about it happening to somebody that you are very close with, or you may be exposed to details firsthand, either in a repeated or extreme way. So for example, if you are a frontline clinician working in an emergency department or critical care unit where you may be seeing trauma ongoing. Even if your experiences with cancer may not fit the traditional definition of trauma that you see here, I think it's helpful to stick around as we go over the warning signs of traumatic stress because they're varied and they are somewhat common in people affected by cancer. And most importantly, they may help to explain reactions that you may not entirely understand or that you may not necessarily attribute to stress related to cancer. Also, there's a chance, although less common, that post-traumatic stress can interfere with your ability to take care of your health. For example, it may lead you to avoid taking medications or going for follow-up cancer care because of wanting to avoid that stress, which makes it even more important that we're talking about it now. So after a traumatic or difficult event, it can make, take time to make sense of what's happened, and that's natural. On the other hand, sometimes our reactions can get stuck. And also keep in mind that when it comes to cancer, your difficult events or your stressors can be ongoing. They can be evolving over time. It, unexpected things can happen, which can impact the process of making sense of what's happened or 
what is continuing to happen. So let's talk about some ways where our reactions to traumatic or difficult events related to cancer or anything else can get what we call stuck. This is when during the traumatic event or difficult event, you perceive that you've lost control or a sense of control, or maybe you have limited support from other people in your life. Maybe you have experienced prior difficult or traumatic life events. Maybe you are experiencing intrusive thoughts. So thoughts that jump into your mind when you don't want them to and you can't get them out related to what has happened. Or maybe you find yourself avoiding what might trigger you to have intense emotions about what has happened. So these aren't necessarily signs that you will definitely experience post-traumatic stress, but they're some of the risk factors that can be involved. Now let's focus on common signals of traumatic stress. So we've talked about general stress, but what should we look for when it comes to post-traumatic stress? How do we make sense of these symptoms? I'm going to talk about four domains of symptoms. The first signal of traumatic stress is what we call re-experiencing. This has to do with those intrusive thoughts that I was talking about, or maybe even flashbacks of what's happened when you don't want them. The second signal of traumatic stress is what we call arousal or activation. It's where you might have trouble winding down to fall asleep. You might feel that you are on edge or you might be extra vigilant to what's going on around you or maybe even let's say in the case of cancer, extra vigilant to signs or symptoms that your cancer is getting worse or has returned. The third signal of traumatic stress is what we call negative thoughts and feelings. And we're talking about pretty intense feelings that you may have. So for example, guilt that you may have caused your cancer or intense feelings of blame about other people. Maybe you're feeling disconnected from loved ones and maybe you've lost interest in the things that you usually have enjoyed or found meaning in. So for example, maybe since your cancer diagnosis or treatment, you found yourself losing interest in spending time with loved ones. The fourth signal of traumatic stress is avoidance. We've touched on this a little bit, but this is when you make regular efforts to avoid reminders of the event. So maybe you find yourself avoiding the street um, that you would drive down to get to the hospital where you received your treatment. Maybe you shut off the television when there's a show or a commercial about cancer or a cancer medication. So these are the general signs and signals to consider that would be signs and signals of post-traumatic stress. Maybe you have all of these, maybe you have none of these, maybe you have some of them. So it's helpful to know what they are. So let's talk about what to do about them. The first one I wanted to talk about was those intense thoughts and emotions. It may not necessarily be possible to stop flashbacks from happening or to you know, stop that arousal from happening or that activation from happening. But when you do notice intense thoughts and feelings, there are some steps that we can take. So again, sometimes we're not always aware of the negative thoughts that we're having about a situation, but we're usually aware when we're feeling intense emotions. And these would be things like guilt, blame, fear, anger, or shame in an intense and uncomfortable way. So it's helpful to rewind and try to understand what are the thoughts that might be related to these intense feelings that you're having. So for example, you might find that your sense of guilt or self-blame or shame is connected to a thought like, look what I've done to my family by having cancer and putting them through this. Or for example, maybe you start to feel anger or fear in an intense way, and you might find it's related to a thought like, I have no control over my health anymore or a thought like, since my diagnosis, everything is wrong. You could start to see that the flavor of these thoughts, again, they're very negative, they're very intense, and they're also often very self-critical or blaming. And usually they have some distortion to them. So what do we do once we've noticed these thoughts? Think of it as your lens on your life. When you start to have these intense thoughts and feelings, your lens on life can get somewhat narrow and it starts to focus specifically on the negative in the absence of neutral 
or positive thoughts and things going on in your life. So it's not that we're trying to move towards being Pollyanna and thinking that everything's wonderful. We just wanna make sure that our lens on life is capturing everything. When we're in this state of stress, it's often more likely that we're gonna to stick to the negative thoughts and feelings. They are like Velcro, whereas the more neutral or positive experiences tend to be less sticky or less memorable like Teflon. So what you're hoping to do with all these negative thoughts that might be crowding your mind is to think, can I widen my viewpoint? Can I get unstuck from these distorted thoughts? It's likely that if you heard a friend or a loved one have these thoughts, you would hope that you could help them loosen around these thoughts and see the bigger picture. So what you're trying to do here is to do that for yourself. The next thing I wanted to talk about is addressing avoidance. What do we do about avoidance? The first is we want to identify what are the reminders that cause us to have a stress response? Why do we do this? Because often what happens is that we're so trying hard to avoid that stress response from happening, we start to avoid lots of things in our lives. And this is important, especially if you find yourself avoiding activities for taking care of your health. For example, if you're avoiding taking your medications because you don't want to be reminded of being sick or having been sick, or maybe you are thinking of avoiding follow-up scans and visits because they're so stressful. Um, it's also important if you find yourself avoiding things that bring joy and meaning to your life. So for example, maybe you find yourself avoiding time with family because even though you love family, you find that being around them can be painful because it's a reminder of either the pain that they've gone through because of cancer related experiences that you may have had, or because it reminds you of thoughts you're having about maybe your life being foreshortened and not having as much time as you thought with your family. So recognizing that triggers can be painful, once you can recognize what causes those triggers, you can have a plan ready to manage the distress so you can stay engaged in your healthcare and stay engaged with family or with whatever else brings you joy and meaning in your life. So again, think about what causes you to have a stress response. Is it sights, specific sounds or smells um, that remind you of difficult times during your cancer care? Maybe it's particular people, times of day, situations, places, physical sensations. It can be so many things. So think broadly about this. Really try to capture what are your triggers. And then once you're able to do that, then you can develop a coping plan. Again, why would you do this? So that you may have these stress responses, but it doesn't stop you from staying engaged in what is enjoyable and meaningful and important to you. So now let's talk about supporting a loved one. When you see a loved one go through stress or the signs and symptoms we've talked about related to post-traumatic stress, it can sometimes lead us to feel helpless because we don't necessarily know how to help that person feel better. So I'm gonna walk through some basic steps you can take to support a loved one. And even if you feel like these are small things to do and they're not gonna fix the bigger problem, just know that these things that I'm mentioning are important and they are things you can do to help your loved one and also to feel less helpless yourself. First is to provide a safe space where that person can talk or not talk and not feel judged or criticized. Let them tell you what they need instead of making assumptions about what you think they need. And then remain calm and don't rush things, remembering that everyone has their own timeline for coping and recovery. What else can you do? Expect a range of reactions. So remember the intense emotions that can come with post-traumatic stress and also the avoidance. So sometimes you might see somebody shut down and you also might see somebody having very intense emotions. Expect that range and also acknowledge with them that they may continue to feel all these different emotions. And that is um, not that there's something wrong with them. Reminding them there is no right way to go through this. There's no sense of shame or self-blame in terms of how someone might be struggling or coping with something. The last thing that I wanted to mention is probably the most important point of this talk is that most people recover from a traumatic or difficult event that even if it's difficult now, we can recover as a function of our own 
innate resilience, our strengths, and the coping skills that we've honed throughout our lives. This is really helpful because it helps to take away the stigma of having personal struggles. At the same time, I will just recommend that if you find that the symptoms and strategies that we've been talking about today are interfering with your quality of life or are particularly distressing, to um, consider reaching out for support from a member of your healthcare team. So I'll end on this point of resilience. I just wanted to thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video today.